Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Uh, it's 4 o'clock. It's 12 o'clock for me. Um, so it's a little early, and I was here. Definitely early. It's 5 o'clock for me. <laughs> so we're all over the place. But um, so we wanted to start with you know, giving you a little bit of context of why we chose this topic. And you know, where is the CPO role going into 2017? So I've been fortunate enough to participate in the Big Idea Summit before. And every time, it just keeps getting better and better. And it's always about what's the next big idea, what's the next big thing. Um, so when Philippe and I were talking about you know, presenting, we said, what's the biggest idea we can come up with? And that was, well, let's predict the future. Nobody can top that. <laughs> but um, it's hard, right? We, we don't have a crystal ball. We, we don't really have a time machine. Uh, but we have some concepts, and so hopefully we can, you know, take this journey together and, and ultimately get to, you know, what the future should look like, uh, an ideal future for, for the CPO in the, in the next 50 years. Uh, in order to do that, we came up with just a little bit of a roadmap. Um, what is it that we need in order to define that future? Um, so first things first, we don't really, we, we can't define where we're going and we don't know where we're coming from. So we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, then, then we will talk about uh, how to turn into a CVO. We wanted to keep the CVO acronym till the end, but we've already quite extensively talked about it, mm -hmm. the Chief Value Officer. Uh, so this is really about the transformation of the function. Right. Um, and then, you know, try to make it a little bit more of a um, dialogue, right? Uh, it's not just about what we think the, ro the role is going to be, what the future is going to look like, but what do you think? it's going to happen in the next 40, 50 years, right? Um, so what would be the vision um, that you have for the next 20, 30, 40 years? And then we're going to talk also about the disruptions that are already happening, uh, following to the, the history of the, the procurement, and where we're heading and what disruption you are experiencing today in your function. And hopefully we get to talk about what needs to be prioritized together, right? What are the things that we need to ask ourselves and uh, execute on in order to be able to, to be successful? So there's three questions that we want you to keep in mind uh, as we go through this. Um, hopefully thought-provoking questions. The first one is, how far can you see? If you look at your business, if you look at your operation, say, I'm very clear that five years from now, this is what the CPO role is going to look like for our organization. Or I can go even further, I know where you know, technology is going to lead us 10 years. How far is that? How, can you define the future in 2040? If you were to look back um, you know, to you know, 2000 or 1990, what procurement was all about, do you think you would have been able to predict where we are today based on what we're doing then? Uh, and so we put ourselves in that position now. How far can you see? Yeah, and uh, in an age of uh, information where we're flooded with, uh, with data from, we talked about social network, from system, from third party system, what is credible and how do we organize this information in order to make the, the right decision? Uh, big data, AI, blockchain, how do we structure all this uh, into something that brings man still uh, in the middle of decision? Yeah, and then the other part of this is, you know, all this is our data, our information. Uh, what about the market drivers? What about the external influencers? How are we capturing that information and make it useful for us in the decision-making process? Uh, one of the things that we ask our customers all the time is, how good is your data? Do you know your spend? Do you know it well? A lot of them say, yeah, absolutely. So can we take a look? And we look at it and I'm like, really? No. <laughs> and others have exactly the opposite situation. They, they think, eh, probably not great. Uh, then we look at it and it actually has a lot more to it, right? It's just that they don't know how to read it. So data is important not just because what it is, but how it can be interpreted. Um, and then ultimately, you know, this is a people business, right? Irrespective of the technology, the data, um, the information, we're going to need some skills. We're going to need some people to do this. Uh, whether we are the CPO and we're bringing up a team or we're hiring or, you know, we had a great discussion earlier about recruitment and, and you know, what skills that we need to be looking for. Uh, how do we develop those skills and what are those skills going to be all about? Hmm. Okay. Take a journey. Yeah. <clears throat> so as Diego was saying, to know what, where we're going, we have to know where we come from. 
as you know, the first traces of uh, procurement uh, started with the Egyptian when they built the pyramids. And they were keeping a track on papyrus at the time uh, of stock, and they were paying the workers with beer. And that's <laughs> that was a good salary, right? Uh, that was the beginning, really, of procurement. Then, not so funky for the function, but uh, William the Conqueror uh, consolidated tax records and keep the, the track of goods uh, coming from the colonies. That was already a kind of pre-supply chain organization, we could say, right? Mm -hmm. Then there was the, re the Industrial uh, Revolution. That was the big shift, obviously, with the acceleration, the population growth, and uh, all the new needs, and this, uh, uh, you know, with the, the, the machine starting, and uh, all the raw material, and this is like the Big Bang uh, in 1800, when starting with supply chain, uh, the function really started. Uh, and uh, developed itself until World War I and World War II, uh, where it was more, of course, after the war, a clerical function, uh, where people had to count everything and in a difficult uh, economical times with plans like Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe. It was really about uh, controlling, getting uh, competitive bids and allocating the right uh, resources at the right place. Then we have the big shift of the 90s with uh, e-commerce starting, uh, first with B2B, then developing into B B2C in a second time. So that was really the time of uh, internet and cost mitigation, uh, preparing the globalization, going with the globalization, again with a massive increase of the world population and a massive uh, increase in the need of uh, finished products. Uh, which led to really this lead time quality for the function, where the function was really uh, KPI'd, I would say, on, this, uh, on these elements of price, lead time, and quality, but at the same time with a global boom of uh, the beginning of the SaaS solution, the cloud solution, which were consolidating data from all across the world, and we're starting to give uh, visibility to organization of all the data across the world. So go global, source local, uh, and also the tough time for suppliers, where suppliers were really not so well treated in industries, maybe like the automotive industry, uh, with reverse auction and all these processes what were, that were quite harsh on the suppliers with the very detailed cost breakdown, so you could see where they were doing their margin. That was the time of savings. And then this uh, end uh, kept evolving to now integrated systems and uh, system talking to each other and, uh, and analyzing this uh, big data we were talking about earlier. Yeah, no, and you know, as I look at this timeline, you know, one, one thing that I you know, keep seeing is, is there's, there's, different, there's a pattern here of major events, right? So, uh, obviously, you know, way earlier when there was not, there wasn't necessarily an acceleration of you know technology or, or people movement. Um, the gap, you know, between one major event into the next one was way way wider than, than in recent years. But all these major changes in the procurement function have been triggered by something pretty major. Um, and right now we're living in an age where a lot of things are happening. I, I can't really pinpoint one event. Right, it's everything. It's um, sustainability. We've talked about it all day. Um, the environmental impact. We're talking about conflict. We're talking about uh, pandemics. We're talking about all these major factors that, if the procurement function isn't ready to adapt to, and we've talked about adaptability as well, then we're not going to survive. <laughs> and so, um, how do we start defining, you know, the the, the function going forward? So we came up with a few ideas. Um, initially, we thought about, all right, well, let's just take the same type of approach, build up a timeline, and say, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be this, 20 from it, you know, it's going to be that, 30, 40, 50 years, and, and try to define that. And then we realized that we're going to be fought on that quite badly, because we don't really know. But we can talk about the trends, and we can talk about the things that are happening today. Um, and ultimately, you know, get real crazy in, in thinking about what could be a huge idea in 50 years from now. 
if we start you know, from where we are today on that integrated source to pay ecosystem, um, you know, technology, working with people, and orchestrating that whole thing in, in a process that gets from identifying a vendor, qualifying that vendor, uh, running an actual um, uh, discussion, whether that it's a, you know, enabled by an RFP or not, um, to enable the negotiation, to maintaining the relationship, to paying the vendor, and hopefully, ultimately, using those relationships with those suppliers to drive innovation is what's happening today. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's doing it. It just means that the technology is already there. And somebody earlier today talked about the future is already here, it just hasn't been disseminated. It's exactly the same thing, right? We already have these technologies. We already have these solutions. Um, you know, how, how do we take it to the next level? Um, our chief innovator, innovating officer, because we do have an innovator officer, uh, has a very uh, good demo. Um, his name is Julian. And he has developed in the technology that ties to our platform that works like the Alexa or the Google um, Assistant, right? Uh, specifically related to your spend data. Um, where you go and basically say, what's my total spend for the last quarter? And they immediately would say, 300 million. What were my top three suppliers? And they would list them one by one. In which regions are they located? Uh, what other capabilities they have? And start tying that information, not just to your data, but also to what the market news, what the risk indicators are out there to ultimately give you much more power to the decision making process. Yeah. So, go ahead. Take the, just technologically, uh, we have a single code base uh, platform. So when this query is sent vocally through this uh, digital assistant, vocal assistant, it sends a query all across the database, including third party systems included. So you get reports in real time. Uh, automated. Uh, yeah. yeah. So one reason why that's very important and I think is very relevant is because as consumers we go to Amazon and we expect that experience, right? That we buy whatever and then they, some, somebody comes up and say, well you bought this, you might be interested in that. And so you start looking at predictive analytics but also the behavior of the consumer, not just as a person but as a business. So if you think about um, the ability to get that information like that, from your systems, from your solution. How are you going to enable the next generation to be able to procure faster and being better at negotiating? Uh, which kind of leads me into the next one, which is integrated data and predictive analytics. So uh, recently, I was asked to talk about the importance of spend analysis. And our process, when we consult our clients, it starts with looking at their spend and looking at their data. What we do with that then is we built up a roadmap and we say, well, these are the categories that seem to be you know, having some issues, whether there's way too many suppliers you want to consolidate that or whether it's uh, you know, a really big spend that you may want to take a, you know, a deep um, uh, interest in or, or whatever the case is. Uh, ultimately, the, what you've done right, can help you predict the future and that's just a principle of statistics. But it can also tell you what patterns, what behaviors the organization is, is going into, whether there is compliance or not, right? You can see how you pay your suppliers and, and, and whether those payments are being effective to the goals of the organization, whether you're abiding by your contract or you need to talk about payment terms or you need to enable your supply chain differently. So spend analysis and, and all these new tools in AI and AI and, um, and, and, and these um, uh, algorithms can actually start to t tell you well, do you want to look at this differently? Do you want to engage your, your business owners differently? Do you want to tackle a category not just from a consolidated supplier base, but you know that every time you place a contract with a specific type of category, you're not compliant. So that means that operations is not necessarily purchasing based on the contract. And so start looking at the, the organization vertically and horizontally. Um, That's where AI also is... Uh is kicking in uh, in all type of solutions because you you remain with a strategy with a business strategy, but it suggests you it reorganizes the data. So we reorganize categories, for example, and you will see where you can make uh, profits on which categories automatically. That's where the AI would kick in, and uh, in the reorganization of the data, which then leads you to that, uh, AI enabled negotiations, complex mm. supply chain inter integration and transparency. So if now the data is, is able to predict behavior, 
and AI is able to make recommendations. So if you bought this this way last time, you're very likely to do it again, or you're likely to repeat that behavior on this other category. Then bringing in the external information from you know risk, from market exposure, from news, from whatever it is, that may talk about hey, you know there's a likelihood of this company buying its competitor. There's going to be a merger. There's going to be the investiture. These types of things that can say well your supply chain now is at risk because if these two vendors merge, then what happens to your spend? Those types of crazy things can start to happen, and then AI can start to give us that information. Now, if that's the case, I would imagine they can also help us identify what's the right leverage to negotiate. So should we go back to those suppliers and engage them in a conversation to reduce cost or to maybe start uh, becoming a little bit more creative on, on, on how we can innovate together? Or ultimately, what does that mean to our relationship between us being the customer and you being the supplier? Um, so it'd be interesting if the case is that you know machines are doing that work and they're doing negotiation, then the paradigm shifts because then the the role of the CPO is no longer to produce savings, cost avoidance, uh, or anything like that, but to really start producing value, to start focusing on. Um, innovation and creativity in supply relationship management uh, and, and um, supply chain value, uh, the priorities change, right? So if we want to go from a CPO pure role and eliminate that procurement work from that role and create value, then we need to have a, a, a mind shift. Um, ultimately, if we are able to do that, if we're able to change our minds, if we're able to change the way that we operate, that we relate with our suppliers, the way that we look at our data, the way that we use technology, then maybe 70 years from now, we don't have to worry about supply chains uh, being disrupted. We're going to be able to predict those things, and that's where real value is created because then we start supporting the community in a different way, right? So if you really look at the future, right, where cost is no longer the priority but sustainability is a priority, this is a potential path, right? Again, this is a big idea, hasn't been proven, hasn't been tested, but ultimately that's that's where we want to go, right? How do we enable full integration with the community, with the people, with um, you know NGOs, other companies, other organizations that ultimately we drive value together, right? That's the true vision of a chief value officer. Um, do you have any comments on that, Philippe? No. So we thought about, um, you know, some trends uh, around what's happening in procurement. Yeah, so this is like predictive, what's, what are the trends coming? But first of all, uh, we think the CPO function uh, is moving to being more recognized and to be as recognized, if I may say, as finance. Uh, we see in our industry uh, a lot of projects that were owned previously by finance, for example, P2P, uh, projects would be now also co-owned by CPOs or owned by CPOs uh, and we have an approach which is the market trend uh, which is end-to-end -end suite we mean like a source to pay and as Diego mentioned earlier we also have order to cash solution plus services which is the core centric vision of the future so today we see uh, more and more, uh, before CPOs were owning sourcing, complex sourcing projects where they could show value and quick ROI, and now more and more they are, they are recognized as the finance departments uh, and they own the full scope of the project. Also, uh, CPOs were not at the board of uh, all the corporation. They were reporting often to finance. As you probably know, in Europe, you have only 28% of uh, CPOs which are reporting, which are part of the board and reporting to the CEO, and it's shifting. In the US, it's 20%. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this is kind of changing, uh, reversing, which is good. Uh, we also notice in the function that the function is asked more and more. Uh, it, has, it is asked to be the ambassador of its own function across the organization because you probably all notice that you know your company really well you work with all the different division of the companies so you know transversely well the company but the, the people in the company don't know you usually they think you're buying and you need to get a price and that's your job so more and more uh, the CPOs are asked to be the ambassadors internally of the function 
Um, so that's another shift we've noticed. Then the disruptive uh, business model, uh, part of this evolution as well. Um, for example, I give you a simple example. Uh, Schneider Electric, about seven years back, you probably know this French company, alongside with Saffron Group, uh, with Alstom, uh, created a fund, a venture capital firm called Aster Capital. And they started funding uh, startup uh, companies with, uh, uh, which were disruptive in their industries. And we see uh, new ideas, new business model, new ways of working for CPOs with their suppliers, uh, providing them capital, uh, supporting them with innovation. Um, that's also a shift in the function because the future uh, of CPOs, when before they were done selecting suppliers through RFPs, we can go back to RFPs at the end because personally, I'm for RFPs, for, uh, for complex sourcing. You know, if you have a corporation like Ericsson that purchased 20, 18, sorry, 16 billion every year and has a turnover of 20, they need to put a, a process like RFPs for selecting suppliers, I believe. Uh, but yeah, back to the business model. As I was saying, <coughs> the, the, the challenge for CPOs is to keep the best suppliers. So they have to be innovative in the way they address them, they support them, and they keep them, and they don't go to work with competitors. That's a shift also in the function. Then short cycles, time to market. Uh, in a way, you know all about the Moore's law, that every two years uh, you have twice the number of transistors in a microchip than two years before, and the price is divided by two. So this acceleration uh, that we have noticed for years has led to this, you know, constant uh, time to market that has to be shortened. Uh, a good example is mobile phone that typically today lasts for a year and a half. That's the life expectancy of a uh, mobile phone. Not that you step on it like I do all the time. Yes, exactly. Um, but also we will see, I think Diego was talking about uh, pandemia and things like that. We'll see new type of procurement cycles. Of course, related to sustainability, to ecology, to energy, related to pollution, but also to cost, uh, to labor cost uh, going up in emerging countries. I give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, if you look back uh, to when was that? That was in 2010. The labor cost of a Chinese worker was 8.3 times less than one of uh, an American worker. Ten years after, it went to 2.9 to 1. So all this, uh, the progress made, the, the salary, the social condition going up in emerging countries, I think that could lead to kind of relocation alongside with sustainability and short cycled geographically uh, for procurement. I have a I have an example too yeah. um, on on that particular one and how you know procurement really needs to be agile. One of our customers, uh, it's a global conglomerate of uh, four different companies that produce locks, doors, cabinets, um, and faucets, and they ship all over the world. And as soon as the tariff um, uh, penalties were announced by the U.S. government last year, um, Walmart and Target in the U.S. decided to uh, ship ahead everything they needed to come out of China. And they saturated the marketplace. So carriers didn't have any more container space available. So when our customers said, okay, we need to fill up our warehouse and so we'll get ahead of the tariffs and we don't have to pay for the extra tax, the container uh, company said, no, thank you. And they're like, well, we're giving you more business. Give us a better price. And I'm like, no, because there's only such a there's a limited amount of space in what's called containers. So we don't have more, we don't want more business. So when you look at it from a procurement perspective, a typical leverage for anybody is, well, I'll give you more business, you give me more volume, you get a better uh, discount. In this case, it was exactly the opposite. So how does procurement react to something like that when, you know, from a tweet, right? All of a sudden the market changes drastically and they had to figure it out, they brought us in to help. We, you know, we did a good job, we survived. But ultimately, it's that agility, and it's, it's one of those things that mm. are short of the, the procurement cycle. You can't sit down and say, oh, let's do an RFP. It's going to take about six months. We're going to the five largest carriers in the world. You can't do that, right? How do you react, and how do you really survive in, in, in times like that? So it's just another, yeah. another example. Uh, two more points quickly on this one. 
Uh, if we relocate, what happened to the lost skills? Will technology be able to supply them or not? And that's one point open for thinking. And the other one also uh, we can notice more and more is that the end customer has a more bigger impact every day on the supply chain, on the procurement, because he wants to know what he's buying, how it's made. And that leads me to my last point. Uh, he wants to know uh, if it's uh, respectful of the sustainable development goals uh, uh, that were defined in the conference in Rio, the January 2012. Uh, and that's the challenges I think procurement will be facing. To please the end customer, to link procurement to sales, and to respect these SDGs, which already had a big impact. I just give you three metrics. Uh, One billion people lifted from poverty since 1990. Child uh, mortality dropped more than half, and out of school kids dropped more than half as well, all this since 1990. So these global policies are really uh, a trend for uh, global progress, I believe. Uh, we're done on time. Okay. Um, so you know, when we, when we talk about all this conceptually, then we also have to think about, all right, what do we do? What do we prioritize? How do we put all this together and orchestrate it in a way that it's actually going to take us to that next stage, whatever that is. If we want to achieve full sustainability in an ecosystem of ecosystems, uh, or we just want to enable AI, whatever it is that our goal is going to be as CPOs. Um, but if you think about it from a really general perspective, there's only three domains that um, procurement can really influence. Um, one of it is, is the people involved, right? I'm talking about you know the CPO, the team under the CPO, um, the category managers, the buyers, etc. Um, the other one is, is the supplier base, right? So it's, it's the ones who we buy stuff and, and services from. Uh, and then the third one is the business, right? So this is what we're buying for. So it's the marketing department, it's IT, it's operations, it's all those different areas that need procurement support. Um, the one thing that we were talking about that really resonated this morning around uh, the recruiting process was how are, how are we addressing these things as historically being what do we need from them, right? Not necessarily asking us what do they need from us. <coughs> what is it that, that we need to ask the people as we're hiring um, to have in, in, in the form of a skill? There's new, you know, curriculum coming up with new procurement and supply chain functions and programs and all those things. But what we really want is a skill set. We want people who can negotiate, who can analyze data, who can understand data, who can manipulate technology. Uh, what is the right program? If we look at our university, are, are they, you know, putting people out in marketplace with those skill set or not? Um, so how do we enhance the recruitment process? And how do we select the right people to do everything that we want to do in the future? Isn't and it? how do we attract them as well? And how do like we attract them, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, so that to me is key. Um, what do our suppliers want, right? We always ask them, or we actually always tell them what we want from them, but are we asking them, what do you need from me, right? How do I make you more successful? Because if we start asking those questions, then we start innovating. We just start driving the discussion towards that goal. Um, I have a, a, a story on that. One of our uh, former clients, an AU visual company in the U.S., one of the largest ones, um, in charge of basically putting, you know, audiovisual equipment for conferences, uh, was struggling because they had major events where they had to plug in 10,000 cables and, and everything around, uh, and everything was very prone to fail, right? One person tripped on one cable and everything came down. And one of their ma major suppliers was Dell Computers. And they said, this is very complex for operations. It has way too much uh, risk. And it, it, you know, it's also a fire hazard. So what do we do? So then they'll said, let us develop something for you. They came up with this new prototype of equipment that would basically plug everything together. Um, and it worked flawlessly. And so what happened then was that our client had access to um, state-of-the-art technology that nobody else had to develop a complete new competitive advantage over anybody, right? They were the only ones who had this technology. And Dell was prototyping new technology real-time, right? So that's a great synergy of great innovation. So for two years, commercially, our client didn't have to pay more than the cost of, uh, of the tool. No markup, no anything. Uh, and they had the right to claim that they had this technology. In turn, Dell was able to get their 
research and design department to basically eliminate any flaws potentially associated with that. So that's when you start engaging your supplier base by asking them what do they need, what do they want. They want better technology, they want better services, let's work together. And then finally business, and, and Philippe talked talk about this earlier, we need to promote as a procurement function our success, right? The value of what we produce, right, is going to be perceived based on uh, not just the hard metrics, but the way that we sell that. And one of the things that we tell our clients is you don't have to go and sell big and everything you can do. You just go and say, we just saved this much. Can we do this for you? What do you need from us? And then start making that procurement function a of a strategic value to the business, right? Those three simple things can start ha getting you into having the right conversations. So those are the three steps that we believe um, can, can get us there. Anything to add to that, Philippe? Yeah, no, I think the, yeah. So, so I, you know, this is pretty much it. We wanted to throw this question back to you and yeah. ask you, what is, it, what is it gonna take you to become the Chief Valley Officer in the future? Uh, but we're also open to, to questions. Thanks very much to Diego Fleet.